back and um, share the Word of God. I wasn't able to make it the last time uh, just because of life and, and things like that, but um, it's good to see uh, familiar faces, and then, but a lot of you I don't know, so you're, so you're looking at me and sizing me up and wondering, you know, here's a funny looking feller, but I'm doing the same thing to you all too, so it's, uh, it evens it out. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm going to be preaching this morning out of John 21, if you want to open your Bibles and go ahead and make your way over there, John chapter 21, and I'm going to talk this morning on uh, what a seaside breakfast will teach us about the grace of God. Uh, before we do that, I do. Uh, I am be remiss if I did not say that it is a joy to, or I say joy. It's surreal to be um, realize that yesterday um, in downtown Louisville, no babies were aborted. Amen. Amen. So our church is affiliated with um, a, a group out of Louisville, with Emmanuel Baptist Church, Speak for the Unborn primarily through sidewalk, abortion sidewalk counseling, and uh, there was no need to go yesterday. So, uh, but the battle is not over, because just because it's not legal doesn't mean it won't be taking place, and the enemy will be um, doing what he can do. But at the same time, I want to implore you all um, to do what we can do, to call our legislators and when they reconvene or special session or something, something needs to be done to lower the cost of adoption in our commonwealth. I think there's some, the statistics is somewhere around 33 parents for every one child that's waiting for adoption. And so it's not that there's not enough people to adopt. It's, there's too much. It costs so much money and all the bureaucratic red tape. And so my wife and I being foster adoptive parents, and we've been through that. We know exactly uh, what that is. But um, anyway, make that a point of prayer, but you've got to put feet to your prayers and call your legislators and let them know this is something that needs to be done. Um, because we're pro we want the babies to live, but we also want them to live fruitful lives. And um, so make that a point of prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll begin. Most glorious and blessed Trinity, three persons and one God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Incline yourself to us, O God, for we are poor and needy. Open our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your law. Unite our hearts to fear your name. And satisfy us in your loving kindness all the day long. And let every word of our mouth and meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, we pray this in the name of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit who prays for us and groanings too deep for words. Amen. Amen. John 21, and uh, we'll begin to read verse 1 here in a moment. Of course, uh, being homecoming, you come back and there's a lot of memories that people will talk about and different things and sharing, reminiscing, and memories are good. Um, it's things that we cherish over time. Um, but there are some people who want to forget, and they can't, literally. Um, there are about 50 people or so in the United States at last count that's been diagnosed uh, with this condition called hyperthymesia. It's known as a highly superior autobiographical memory. And so one of these individuals is a lady named Andrea Wolf. She was being interviewed one time, and they asked her to describe how she remembers every detail of her life. Um, every mundane activity like driving a Target for groceries, uh, which occurred more than 10 years ago, or she remembers what she wore and ate every day for the past decade. She remembers if the fan was on the running in the bedroom on a certain date of the year. Sometimes this extraordinary ability is an advantage, but she would say many other times it's a curse. Imagine for instance, remembering all the wrong things done to you or all the wrong things you've done to others. That can be pretty crippling. So forgetfulness can be a blessing as well. There are things that we love to remember. There are things we'd rather forget. And in our text this morning, we're, we're going to see someone who I think wants to forget some things, or at least one thing. 
Uh, the Apostle Peter, at this time he's the disciple Peter, who had boasted of his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, but in a moment of weakness d- denied his Lord, he experiences the pain of remembrance and the shame that accompanies it. Let's just begin reading in verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. After this, Jesus revealed himself by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Well, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Verse 7, that does, this is the key verse here. That disciple whom Jesus loved, it's John, therefore said <clears throat> to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it, it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment, for he stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have caught. But So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish... This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after He was raised from the dead. What we have here is a third narrative account of the resurrection with eyewitnesses. Uh, Paul writes about this in, um, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I believe it is, and he talks about he was seen by many witnesses, one time over 500 at once. About two to three weeks after the resurrection, and the disciples are at the end of an unproductive night of fishing. What I want us to understand here is that Jesus has been sovereignly orchestrating this event to reiterate what He had taught them in John 15, 5, which was, apart from Me, you can do nothing. Now this event is very similar to another one about three years or so earlier in Luke chapter 5. So if you hold your place and turn to Luke 5, I'm not going to read all of it, but just turn to it for reference, sort of summarize what takes place here. It's when Jesus first calls the disciples and uh, he was there preaching and the crowds were pressing against him so much so that he he sort of sequestered a boat and had them push out a little bit in the water so he could preach from the boat. And after he got done preaching, he told the disciples, or at that time they were not the disciples, he was going to call them, he told these guys to go out into the deep and put out their nets for a catch. And they had already been fishing all night. The text says that when Jesus found them, they were washing their nets. That's what they would do. Like a good mechanic, he will clean his tools after he finishes working with them. These fishermen, were they were cleaning their nets because it was expensive and they wanted to get all the stuff that would cause them to uh, rot and break. So they were very good quality nets. And so he gets them, take, they take them out into the, to the water. He preaches, he sits down, he says, let's go out, let's go out here and go fishing. They've been out fishing all night because they didn't fish for fun, they fished for a living and all the fishing was done at night when it was cooler. Not to mention Jesus said go out into the deep water and they, any fisherman worth his salt then knew all the good fish was in the shallower part. But nevertheless, they obeyed Jesus and went out there. And, um, and, and there was some hesitancy in Peter at this time. He says here, I find it right here, he says... Um, he says in verse 4, put out your nets in the deep and let down your nets for a catch. You can imagine Simon thinking, uh, you're the rabbi and I'm the fisherman, man. Stay in your lane. But he didn't say that. He says, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And it says, and when they had done so, they enclosed such a great 
number of fish, their nets begin to break. Remember, they were quality nets. They were taking care of their stuff. There was so much fish, the nets begin to break. They signaled to the partners to come and help them. Their boats began to sink because there was so much fish. And at the result of this, in verse 8, uh, Peter realized there's something different about this rabbi, and he falls down at his knees and he says, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. He realized he was in the presence of someone so much great, such, so much more greater than him. And then he tells them, do not be afraid from now on, you'll be catching men. So it's a very similar situation uh, in this. That, that just like in Luke, like three years earlier, here in John 21, the results are less than the desirable. They'd fished all night and caught nothing. Uh, just like it, it, three years earlier, Jesus calls out to them. They didn't really recognize who he was uh, in Luke 5. They just knew he was a teacher. They didn't recognize who he was in John 21. He calls out to them. He tells them to put on the other side of the boat. And without question, they obeyed. And and you look at this and and you realize there's a good principle here that sometimes God will conceal Himself from us so He can reveal His power to us. Uh, God doesn't always uh, let us His presence be known. Uh, Psalm 13, the psalmist says, How long will you hide your face from me? Uh, There are many times a psalmist will cry out to God, Where are you, God? Where are you, God? Um, Luke 24, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus, he, 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 he covered their eyes in a sense. He hid Himself from them uh, while He was teaching them about the resurrection. And once they realized who this was, it was later on. But the result here in John 21, just like in John or Luke 5, the, re- the result is a catch is too big to haul. Now I said that verse 7 there, is the climax of the passage. ESV has the therefore in the middle. Of, I think mean, King James, maybe a New American Standard, puts it at the beginning of the verse. I think that's the appropriate place because when you see a therefore, it, it, it is telling you why. Because of something happened here, this is what happened. So as a result of what happened, John says, it's the Lord. So the first thing I want us to see here this morning is that remember that Jesus Christ changes sinners. He changes sinners in in, in these certain ways here that we see with the life of Peter, but there are so many more. Their results went from failure to success. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be successful in all your life and everything you do if you trust in the Lord Jesus. Your success is according to the determinate foreknowledge and counsel of God. Your, Your success will be based on His will. But yet, you will go from fail- they went from failure to success, catching nothing to catching an overabundance of fish. Their por- performance went from duty to delight. In Luke 5, Peter says, well, we've been fishing all night. You, you can kind of read into that. Well, Master, we've fished all night long, but nevertheless, we'll, we'll, we'll let down the net. In John 21, there's no hesitation. They, 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 they threw it in. They listened. There was a change in his attitude and... and um, Peter went from being proud to humble, right? We see that same thing in Luke 5. He said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He realized that there's something different about this man, he, that he did not deserve to be in his presence, the realization of his holiness, and he wanted, he, he wanted to, him, Jesus to leave. Sometimes we don't want Jesus around us because he convicts us of our sin, doesn't he? Sometimes we don't read the Bible because it shows us who we are. Sometimes we don't attend worship because we're afraid that God will show us what, we, what needs to change in our lives. But what a difference three years makes for Peter. He went from depart from me, I'm a sinner, to I need to be with Jesus. As soon as he knew that it was Jesus, he, jumped, he, he covered himself, thankfully, and he jumped into the water and swam to shore. He goes from Jesus, leave me, to I need to get to Jesus as quickly as I can. In Luke 5, he reacted to the miracle. In John 21, he reacts to the man. The miracle is what shocked him in Luke 5. Jesus' presence is what shocked him and brought excitement in John 21. In Luke 5, he knew he was unworthy. In Luke or John 21, he knows he's still unworthy. But the difference between then, three years earlier and now, is... Time and circumstances and grace. After three years of following Jesus, even after He had failed Him miserably by denying Him at Jesus' moment when He needed them, 
He knew Jesus well enough to know that he would not be rejected. Just like the prodigal son, he was going to run back to his father with the hopes of being a servant. Peter just knew that Jesus loved him enough that no matter what he did, he was going to accept him back. So that's the first thing I want us to see is Jesus Christ changed the sinners. He changed Peter. He changed me. He changed you. If you're a Christian here this morning, God has changed you. We're not saved by our works. We're not saved by what we do. But when Christ saves us by grace through faith, guess what? He, we love Him so much we want to serve Him. We love Him so much we want to go out and tell others about Him. We want to stand for His truth. We want to see people come to faith in Christ. You see, we can all relate to Peter. Peter was proud. I can relate to Peter anyway. I don't know about you. Peter was proud. He was compulsive. He he constantly stuck his foot in his mouth. My wife could probably say amen to that. But I can relate to Peter. I can relate to his moments of unbelief. I can relate to his crises of faith. I've gone through those times. Three years earlier, he knew he was not worthy. Three years later, he's swimming to the Savior. His desire is to be with the Lord where he is, where, when he calls. And if you're a Christian here this morning, let me just say, your desire should be to be with the Lord where he is, when he calls. Number two. Our guilt is not greater than God's grace. All people are guilty. Every person that's born of a human being, so that's all of us have descended from our first parents, and they have passed on the sin nature to us. So all people are guilty. And all people, though, even though they're guilty, here's the problem. We're all shaped by religious categories, even if we're not trying to, and we feel the need to fix ourselves and make ourselves morally justified. We, we want to turn over a new leaf. We want to stop bad habits. We want to do this. We want to do that. And yet the problem is our ability to fix it is beyond our ability. One secular writer puts it this way. He says, we have no, this is an unbeliever by the way, we have no clear framework or or, or set of rituals to guide us in our quest for goodness. Worse, people have a sense of guilt and sin, but no longer a sense that they live in a loving universe marked up by divine mercy, grace, and forgiveness. There is sin, but no formula for redemption. What What an outlook on life. Friends, the, the, the situation, the, the, the solution, the formula is not a formula, it's the gospel. The Bible says that if you would believe it in your heart, or if you would confess through the mouth of Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. And if you're here, you're not a Christian this morning All you need to do is cast yourself at the feet of Jesus. There's not a special magic prayer. There's not a special magic thing you do. Right there, right now, turn your heart toward Jesus. Just bow the knee of your heart to Jesus. Turn the back on the idols in your life and turn to Jesus and He'll save you. It's it's that simple. And yet we have such a hard time with it because we want to fix ourselves. And here we see a tender moment between Peter and John. It says here, um, verse 9, when he gets to land, he says, they got out on land, he saw charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. So Jesus had already been fishing. He already had breakfast cooked. And we see this moment. And perhaps the memory of failure flooded his mind. Have you ever smelled the smell of fresh baked bread? I know Deborah has. I used, to, I used to eat that stuff, and that's, I bloomed out when I, was, when I left here. But uh, yeah, fresh baked bread or fresh ground coffee. Certain smells. When I, when I, when I cook, when I make scratch gravy with lard at home, something ever down, once every blue moon in a skillet, iron skillet, it, rem- it smells like my, my grandma's house. She put lard in everything. And she put it in her milk, probably. But she lived to be 96, so that's what I'm shooting for. Smells will bring back memories, sometimes good, sometimes bad. 
Uh, perhaps the memories of Jesus or His failures flooded His mind. Perhaps the memories of Jesus' compassion likewise flooded His mind. All the things He had done, the people that He had healed, the people that He had forgiven, the dead He had raised, the sick, that he, the blind He had given sight to, and all these things, the feeding of the 5,000, all these great miracles would have come back upon Peter. But there was this really recent event that He did, which was called denying His Lord right at the crucifixion, that if it were me... As it says, he wept bitterly. He was full of grief and repentance, but yet sometimes those things come back on us. And John wants us to see this connection. See, we don't see this because we have English Bibles, but in verse 9, that word charcoal fire is one word in the Greek. I'm not going to try to say it, but it's, just trust me, it's one word. It's in the Greek, it means charcoal fire. And it's only used one other time in the entire New Testament. Turn to John 18, 18. John 18, verse 18. This is the only other time in the New Testament that it's used, and it's used by John. And John is very methodical in writing his gospel. He uses words strategically for a reason. His original readers would have picked up on this just like that. John 18, 18. Now the servants... This is when, Jesus, when Peter denies Jesus. And right after he just denied him, now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire. Because it was cold, they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. The only other time that's used in the, New Te- well, in the Bible, in the New Testament, John uses it twice. Once, he uses it to describe the, the, the event, the circumstances when right where Peter was standing when he denied Christ. And he uses it again, right where Peter is standing. And he makes a point. He says, they saw a charcoal fire. He makes a point to say that this is something they saw. And if you've ever been around a, a, an old, a good bonfire or, or a wood fire, there's a good smell. There's a smell that comes, right? And, and that would have, in my mind, this, this is just conjecture on my part, do you can imagine that when, G, when, Paul, when Peter came ashore and he saw that, his mind had to go back to the last time he maybe smelled that. His mind would have had to go back to that time, the last time he was by a charcoal fire, he had denied his Lord. And now he's there again, and Jesus is, not only there's a charcoal fire, Jesus is preparing him a meal, and he's inviting him to eat. You see the connection there? I don't think that's insignificant. I think John wants us to see this. He wants us to know that we're not very far removed, humanly speaking, from our past. We're not very far removed, humanly speaking, from our sin. And that's what drives us to Jesus every day. I need Jesus every day. I don't feel like a saved man every day. Not, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't feel like a saved man most days. But feelings don't have anything to do with it. Fact, faith, and feeling. The fact of the resurrection, the fact of Christ, the fact of the Bible, the fact of the gospel stands where I believe it or not, whether or not I have faith in it. My lack of faith in something of God does not negate the fact. But when I put my faith in that fact... I can stand on that because the Bible's Word of God. Christ is a Savior. He is risen. He's in heaven. I believe the promises of God and Christ are yes and amen. That's fact, and there's faith in that fact. Feelings are good, but feelings come and go. That's why the book of, let's read the book of Psalms if you don't believe me. Up and down, up and down. So there's a lot of days I don't feel saved, but I know I'm saved. Not because of what I did or anything, but because of who Christ is and what Christ has done. And I think Peter realizes that, and we don't have time to get into the dialogue between him, but this, if you read, go further and read it, John records the event where Jesus sort of reinstates Peter and, and tells him what sort of death he'll die, but he, sort of, this is, he passes this torch to him as being this, this stalwart leader in the church, this man who had denied him. And listen, friends, before we break to eat, let me, let me say something. There's nothing you've done so bad to make God love you any less. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any more. 
It's perfect love in that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for sinners. If you want to know what perfect love is, that's perfect love. But it's also perfect justice. Because the Bible says that God sent His Son, Jesus, to be the atoning sacrifice for sin so He can be just. Because God doesn't wink at sin. God doesn't, like a, like a grandparent, just go, oh, well, they're just kids. No. God is a just God. And, he, and sin requires justice. Your sin requires justice. My sin requires justice. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He took God's justice so God can be a justifier for those who have faith in Jesus. Now we can be justified because His justice was satisfied in Christ on the cross. And I'll close with this one quote. My youngest will pick up on this because he did a report on him in school last year on John Newton. John Newton was an infamous slave trader. He was the captain of a slave trading ship. He was also the man after his conversion who wrote Amazing Grace. And at the end of his life, I'm not going to put you on the spot, buddy. Don't worry about it. He's overlooking his mom like, he's going, no. But John Newton, at the end of his life, he says this. My mind is nearly gone, but I remember two things. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. If you're here this morning, Jesus says to you, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of your, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the gift of salvation. Holy Spirit, I ask you that you would move even in this place this morning. I thank you for these people here today. I thank you for the faithfulness of those who've served in this church. I thank you for this, this church building. And, and, I, and, and there's, no, there's no insignificance in the fact. We know it's just brick and mortar and wood and nails. But at the same time, it's meant something. It's, it stood as a symbol in this area, as a place where the gospel is preached. And I thank you that it, Imperfect people can come in here from different walks of life and different backgrounds and vocations and economic statuses and all these different things. And they can come together and unite around one gospel. For nearly 200 years, Lord, you've used this, this church building as a meeting place for a small part of the universal body of Christ. And I pray that you would give it many more years of use that the gospel, the light of the gospel will go out around in these hills and hollers around here and that people will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if we meet someone who says, well, I've done this and I've done that, let us take them to John 21 and say, let me show you something about somebody who's done a lot worse than you. Or take them to the life of Paul. and He, he had Christians killed and you saved him. God, you'll save anybody that turns to you in faith. I thank you for that. I certainly thank you for that. You saved me, God. You can save anybody. If there's anyone here this morning, Lord, that needs Christ, I pray that they would go to Him. He has His arms open to receive all who come to Him in faith. In His name we pray. Amen.